Today, uh, I and the Professor Andoriana uh, chair this uh, workshop. Uh, uh, at first, uh, first of all, I'd like to say uh, uh, it is a great pleasure uh, for us that uh, we have so many students attending this meeting. And uh, before starting the this workshop, I'd like to have the uh, opening remarks from the uh, deans of the uh, university, uh, uh, participating universities. I'd like to ask uh, Professor Fujiwara of Kansai University, he is a dean of the uh, School of Biological and Environmental Sciences, uh, so uh, to make uh, uh, the opening remarks. Uh, Professor Fujiwara, please. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank all of you to join this program. Uh, on behalf of the uh, uh, Monsegaku University, I extend a warm welcome to all the participants from Malaysia, Indonesia, and Japan uh, who have gathered here uh, for the opening ceremony, especially uh, Professor Frida, uh, Dean of the Faculty of Applied Science, UITM, uh, Professor Secha, uh, UITM, Professor uh, Tori Vinarai, uh, Dean of uh, uh, Faculty of Fisheries and Marine Science, uh, UN uh, Undip, and Professor Abe Santo Undip also, Hello. and Professor we uh, we uh, we both uh, Dean of uh, Faculty Good afternoon. of Marine Science, yeah. afternoon, <laughs> and uh, Professor uh, uh, Romi uh, Unsud. Uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, joining this program. It is an honor for our university to uh, host this meeting and provide a platform for students and researchers to share their expert uh, or special uh, insights. I hope this gathering will be a source of uh, inspiration to think about uh, biodiversity for all. And if uh, possible, I would like to introduce uh, our university activity briefly. Is this okay? Yep. Oh, please. please. Can I? Yeah, please. Ah, yeah. oh, okay. <laughs> can I share the... Okay, no, thank you very much. Okay, the, can you see? Yes. Yeah, full screen, Sensei. Okay, okay. They are... Uh, for uh, most of... Uh, <laughs> for the Malaysian and Indonesian students, I'd like to briefly where we are now. That this is a map of Japan, and uh, here is a Kansai area. As you know, the uh, Kansai means the area of the West Japan. So in some other words, we say kinky. But the, <laughs> sometimes kinky has some different meanings. So the, uh, we say Kansai. The, in Kansai area, Osaka, Kobe, Kyoto, Nara, actually there are these major uh, places for sightseeing located in the same area. Our university locates in the middle of the uh, uh, Hyogo Prefecture. Actually, it's close to uh, Osaka. The, by public transportation, it takes about uh, one hour from our place. And uh, this is the, uh, we have the uh, two major campuses. And uh, this is the one. And uh, for the uh, uh, science uh, schools, we have we are in the another campus, the Kobe Sanda area. This is a photo of our uh, place. And uh, we are uh, we have the uh, now 14 uh, schools, I mean faculties uh, for the undergraduate program, and uh, more than the 25,000 students are in the school now. The School of Science, uh, School of Bi uh, Biological and Environmental Sciences, School of Engineering, Architectures uh, are in the same campus. So the our we are doing the uh, uh, very, uh, uh, how to say, the uh, uh, extended activity to uh, collaborate uh, with foreign countries. The, now, the uh, uh, from the kindergarten uh, uh, to the uh, 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 graduate school, we have many uh, programs actually, and uh, especially the uh, in science field, we have started collaboration with many uh, uh, universities in uh, South Asia. Now, uh, I would like to introduce some of the activities we are doing. Uh, uh, in 2016, uh, we uh, visited to the Udayana University. The, the, it's, it locates in Bali. Now, started to uh, touch with marine science because uh, we didn't have opportunity to uh, 
study about the marine science and the tropical、uh, plants. And it was a very good chance to、uh, learn for、uh, our students. And we accepted,、uh, actually, we still are accepting uh, uh, people overseas uh, to uh, touch with Japanese culture, our university system, and every year. So the, this is a photo、uh, of the Sakura Science、uh, held at the 2018. The, at that time, we accepted uh, 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 Taiwan and uh, uh, Indonesian people. And、uh, this is a photo of the program. So the student、uh, had an experience. Uh, uh, this is my class. And, uh, uh, besides that, the, we sending our students to、uh, other places. This is a photo of the geoscience program in Taiwan. And,、uh, but Unfortunately, by the、uh, pandemic of COVID 19, we、uh, couldn't have opportunity to go abroad. But、uh, this year, we restarted、uh, to going outside. And this is a photo of the, uh, uh, this March.、Uh, we had the marine science program、uh, collaborating with、uh, uh, Udayana University. And, uh, uh, the student could have a good chance. And、uh, besides that, that during the、uh, pandemic situation, we still Collaborating with other uh, universities uh, using an、uh, online system. And,、uh, this is one of the photos we had、uh, last year. And the Professor To organized、uh, this program. And、uh, many、uh, students in the India, Indonesia, and、uh, some other place, Taiwan, so t h e joined and、uh, we could have a very good time、uh, during the program. And、uh, now the, we are restarting the uh, uh, online program uh, by, the, uh, uh, organizing, uh, by organizing、uh, Professor Bibi and、uh, To Sensei. And,、uh, I hope our collaboration continues and、uh, we could learn more during this program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fujiwara Sensei.、Uh, yes.、Uh, I apologize for the o n b e h a l f of Professor Horida. She is in work in the In another meeting, and will not be able to join us this afternoon. So, I am a、uh, uh, professor, Dr. Mohamed Faiz,、uh, Vice Dean of the Faculty of Black Science at UITM. So, please allow me to uh, uh, deliver a speech on your behalf. So, first of all,、uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. So,、uh, Salam alaikum and a good afternoon, everyone.、Okay. So, first of all, I would like to thank the Organization Committee for inviting UITM and Malaysia to this third online workshop on SDG. I would also like to thank、uh, Professor Shichuki Fujiwara, Dean of School of Biological and Environmental Sciences, Fonse Gokui University, Japan, and also Professor Tri Vinani Augustin, Dean of Faculty of Fishery and Marine Science, Universitas de Ponegoro, Indonesia, and Professor Dwi Abibowo. In o p p o r t u n i t y of Biology, Unicita Sodiman,、uh, Indonesia, for accepting the invitation to join us today in this workshop. So,、uh, again, my, my name is Koma p a i s and I'm the Deputy Dean for Academic Affairs in the Property of Life Science, University of Technology Mara,、uh, UITM for short,、uh, Malaysia. So, today we have four teams from Malaysia who will talk about the conservation of、uh, four endangered animal species in Malaysia, namely the、uh, Malaysia tiger. Elephant, r h i n o c e r u s and zebra. So, as we all know, Malaysia is a mega biodiversity country. Our rich tropical forest is home to a large number of animal species, and a number of these are rich on the endangered list due to loss of habitat as a result of climate change and also human activities. And it's imperative that we take steps to protect this、uh, mega biodiversity, which is not only a rich resource for medicinal products, potential ingredients, new food. But also serve as an important epicenter for the health and well being of all life, including the human. So, I think the same will apply to,、uh, to the, uh, Indonesia with the rich forests and also Japan.、Okay. So, Malaysia is touched very keen and proactive in the conservation of its、uh, nature ecosystem and the animal and plant species they contain. I hope that this workshop will serve as a focal point for collaboration and cooperation between academic centers from different countries. In helping each other and helping our own self to prevent further loss of biodiversity and leading to a more sustainable, healthy, and prosperous future. So, once again, I would like to thank the organizer for providing this valuable platform and look forward to an interesting and fruitful workshop 
with our colleagues from Japan and Indonesia. So with that, thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And the Diplonego uh, University also attend this uh, workshop. And uh, but I heard that uh, uh, Professor Tori Winari cannot uh, make an opening remark today. So uh, uh, next the uh, the uh, gen uh, to general uh, to Suderman yeah. University the. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Wimbrough, uh, the uh, Dean of the uh, Faculty of Biology. Uh, could you please make an uh, opening remark? Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, afternoon. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My esteem from Shinsuke Fujimara PhD. In of the Department of Bio, Bioscience, School of Biological and Environmental Science, Wanse, Queen University, esteemed Prof. Vice, Vice Dean of Faculty of Applied Science, University Technology Mara, esteemed Prof. Rivinarni Agustini, Dean of Faculty of Fisheries and Marine Science, Universi Universitas Diponegoro Undip, Distinguished colleagues and guests, honored participant, valued student of this event. It is with great pleasure and enthusiasm, enthusiasm that I extend a warm greeting from Prokurto Indonesia to each and every one of you in the third online SDGs workshop. Today, in this exceptional event, we are joined by a select group of esteemed participants representing four distinguished universities who have come together to explore and exchange ideas regarding the sustainability and sustainable development goals, especially the 14 and 15. Allow me to express my sincere gratitude to organizer and collaborators, Wensi Gakuin University, University Technology Mara, and University Diponegoro, your in initiative and engagement underline the significance of collective effort in addressing the pressing global challenge and encapsulated in the SDGs. A special thanks to, from, to Professor Shinsuke Fujimari, Ujiwara, SD, the Dean of Department of Bioscience, School of Biological and Environmental Sciences at Wanse Kakuin University. His leadership has been instrumental in guiding our institution's dedication to interdisciplinary research and sustainable practices. Equally important are the enthusiastic students who have joined us, your agents to learn complete cope with your commitment to shaping a more sustainable world is truly inspiring. This workshop offers a platform for you to interest with experts, peers, and diverse perspective, fostering an, an atmosphere of growth and collaboration. The enthusiasm of your participants have come together to create this meaningful platform. In this day ahead, our discussion will revolve or around critical themes such as marine ecosystem, biodiversity conservation, and the delicate balance of life on land and beneath the waters. As we delve into these vital subjects, I encourage each of you to contribute actively, share your insight, and engage world heartedly in this unique learning experience. As we embark on this journey of knowing of knowledge sharing, I wish to extend my heartfelt appreciation to all those who have played a role in making 
the workshop possibly. In closing, and, and let us approach these next two days with open mind, a spirit of collaboration, and a shared commitment to advance the SDGs. Together, we can harness the power of education, research, and cooperation to pay the way for a more sustainable and prosperous future. Thank you, and let us begin this inspiring inspiring voyage of dialect and discovery. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Uhibawo. Okay, let's enter into the uh, presentation. The uh, first group uh, of the uh, first presentation is a group one of Kwansei Gakuin University. Could you please uh, prepare the presentation, group one of the Kwansei Gakuin University? Hello, everyone. We will now begin the presentation for group one. Let us first start by introducing ourselves. We are five members. Misaki Kuramitsu, Ako Watanabe, Miyu Mukai, Nanami Takata, and myself, Natsuki Manai. The main objective of our presentation is to explain the relationship between Satoyama and SDGs. However, prior to this, we present some maps to show the location of our university and where we did our research activities. Hansei Gakuen University is located in Sanda City, Hyogo Prefecture. Let's take a look at a slide. This is a map of Japan, and Hyogo Prefecture is located here. This is an Elrish map of Hyogo Prefecture. Sanda City, where Kansai Gakuen University is located, is here. And Saraike Wetland, where we did our research activity, is located here. Kansai Gakuin University and Sanda City are engaged in various activities to achieve the SDGs. One of the examples of activities for achieving SDGs is the maintenance of Satoyama. And we participated in the activities twice. We will explain more about it later. In Sanda City, there are some wetland areas and they are collectively called Saraike Wetland. Saraike Wetland is designated as a natural monument of the prefecture. But why? Before the fuel revolution, Saraike Wetland was used as a place for people to collect charcoal and firewood. Because of its moderate use, the area didn't become a forest. Bright sunlight reached the ground and the area maintained a poor nutrition environment. These environments provide important habitats for short plants and plants that can survive on poor nutrition. However, because of the changes of people's lifestyles, people no longer came to the wetland. So the wetland became overgrown with trees. Moreover, in 1990s, a project to expand area of the industrial park began and Sanda uh, Saraiki wetland areas were threatened to be destroyed. Fortunately, with the rise of the environmental awareness, Sanda City and the community have changed the policy to preserve the wetland. Constant care is essential to maintain the wetland, so a volunteer organization has been formed and various activities are regularly carried out by the volunteers. Therefore, in our presentation, we discuss the relationship between activities in Satoyama and SDGs projects. First of all, let us explain what Satoyama means. Satoyama is a woodland that is located close to the village. It is a place between natural environment and urban place, and it is composed of villages, farmland, farm ponds, and meadows. 
It accounts for about 40% of Japan, and people collect firewood and wild vegetables there. This is the picture of Satoyama in Sanda. Sorry. Satoyama is a little mountainous, but it's not a place like a high mountain that cannot be controlled by humans. Instead, traditionally, local people Local people protect the rich ecosystem by increasing the number of animals and plants and maintain biodiversity. However, after the period of high economic growth, people de developed large cities, so villages became depopulated because people moved from rural areas to urban areas. And finally, no one took to Satoyama. In the ecosystem of natural environment, the presence of Satoyama is necessary for animals and plants. In fact, more than half of the species that are facing extinction live in Satoyama. Satoyama plays an important role of supplying natural resources for foods and woods and forming great landscapes. Satoyama also protects rich land and maintains the relationship between humans and nature. Moreover, Satoyama has been the place where a lot of animals and plants live in and grow up, and it makes the nature of Japan richer. The biodiversity of our Satoyama has been kept by some activities like agriculture and forestry in regions with city citizens, businesses, and schools. Therefore, these, activi these activities play an important role in maintaining wetland. Next, we would like to introduce various kinds of Satoyama in Sanda City. There are seven Satoyama areas in Sanda City, including Sanraike Wetland. The first Satoyama is Adima Fuji Park. This place is located here on the map. The origin of the name Adima Fuji is view from Adima Onsen is similar to Mount Fuji. The area that stretches along the mountain leads and the foothill formed by Satoyama Forest is regarded as Arima Fuji Park. We can observe a wide variety of plants and creatures close at hand. The wetland in the park is home for endangered species. The second is Salaike Wetland, as introduced earlier. This place is located here on the map. In March 2019, it was designated as a natural monument by Hyogo Prefecture, and it's a valuable wetland boosting of one of the greatest diversity of wetland plant species in the prefecture. Currently, the area prohibits in entrance expect project member who are trying to conserve their plants and creatures, preventing the introduction of alien species and so on. The third Satoyama is Takadaida Nanamatsu Forest. This place is located here on the map. It consists, it, it consists of a red pine forest along the this line, a Kyoka Seleta forest behind the village, plantations along the valley, a bamboo forest near the village, a receiver and rice paddies. This forest is a typical example of Satoyama landscape. The fourth Satoyama is Takadaida Kampuk forest. This place is located here on the map. There are red pine forests along the ridge and the Kuroka Sereta forest at the foot of the mountain, as well as forestation of cypress and cedar trees. There are many valleys and reservoirs that are fed by the forest, and visitors can encounter many creatures that have survived since ancient time. The fifth Satoyama is Otohara Tengu Forest. This place is located here on the map. The trade mainly follows the Zelkova, Cedar, and Cypress forests 
along the mountain stream. The sixth Satoyama is Weiwei Wei Forest. This place is located here on the map. It is Satoyama Forest located in Flower Town and it's managed as a Satoyama in urban area and it's used as a park for citizens. This place is planned for the sustained maintenance of Satoyama Forest. Lastly, there is Muko, Hazama, and Yayoi Forest. This place is located here on the map. The forest stretches along a small path on the border between the flower town of Muko, Hazama, and Yayoi, and Kobe City. And, it, and it's maintained by citizen volunteer. In Sand City, which has many Satoyama area, the Sand City Ordinance for creating a town in harmony with Satoyama was enacted in, in December 2008 in order to achieve harmony between people and nature and between community. The main purpose of this ordinance is to revitalize the community by con conserving Satoyama working together with citizens. By doing this, the Sun City tries to improve the local living environment and to promote agriculture. This ordinance also intends to control installation of solar power generation facilities. Through this ordinance, Sand City is taking various action to conserve Satoyama. When we visited Saraike Wetland, we were able to observe many organisms there. Some plants are rarely seen in other places, and other plants can be seen only once in a lifetime. There are also rare creatures, such as the eggs of the Setoji salamander and endangered species such as the crested ibis and the heron fly, which can be found here although we could not see them at that time. You may wonder why such a diversity of organisms exists in the wetland. It is related to the stratum in Saraike. According to the Saraike wetland website, the geological formation of Saraike wetland was formed by river sediments, and it is composed of alternating layers of sand and gravel and clay. In fact, we were able to observe rounded stone at the base. In addition, generally, the formation is recharged by groundwater but wetland is formed by the accumulation of rainwater. Here is how it works. May it rains, water flows through the gravel layer, and this water flows over the clay layer and ends up in a flat area with no sand and gravel layer. The water stagnates and forms a wetland, like that. Wetland is composed of rainwater and clay. Wetland becomes a unique environment with poor nutrition. Flora plants cannot invade in wetland. Therefore, plants individual to the wetland, which can tolerate the poor nutrition environment, Mainly, shorter plants grow in the wetland. Wetland feeds plants, insects, and many other species that can be found only in wetland. Wetland is, therefore, very important for maintaining biodiversity. Next, a tree called Alnastra vetulosa is a rare tree, and now, 
considered a semi-endangered species. However, when we joined this SDGs program, we cut down some of these trees. We had to because these trees grow so high and if we leave them unattended, they will change the state of the original environment. Compare these two photos. In the picture on the right, there are many trees growing. Tree growing makes a lot of shade and so shorter trees and grasses will be affected and go extinct. Also, these trees absorb water around, which will change the environment. As a result, the original organism can no longer exist and biodiversity declines. To prevent this, we conducted logging activities. These activities are usually carried out in cooperation with standard city residents and private companies, all working together to conserve the ecosystem of Sanna City. By attending our activity like we described, we have learned it a lot and now believe that it is a necessary activity to protect the Satoyama reaching the goal like on land. Perhaps some people may say that the activity to protect the Satoyama could danger nature because sometimes we happen to cut a variable tree. However, actually when we cut tree, some plants that cannot grow because of shade of tree can grow. By doing this, there are a lot of positive points. For example, we can increase the variety of plants and we can protect creatures that can become extinct. This time, we went to Satoyama and when we engaged in the activity protecting Satoyama, we have changed the idea that humans should not get too involved in nature. In the past Japan, people cut trees and they used them in daily life. However, recently, we don't have to do it because people's lives become very comfortable. Instead, we intentionally have to protect nature through human hands in order to solve the problem with forest growth. And we can learn that it is very important for us to achieve the goal of SDGs. And in each suburban, many activities such as tree felling are being conducted to protect nature and ecosystems. We went to Satoyama for the first time, and we could run across the activity to protect plants and ecosystems. If global environmental issues become more serious, we think that these activities to protect nature will become more important to become sustainable earth. There are very few people in Japan and around the world who are aware of activities in Satoyama. So we hope that awareness of these activities will increase in the future. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you very much, Group 1 of Kuwasegaku University. Now the paper is open for discussion. So are there any questions or comments? Okay, Group 3, KGU, Group 3. Could you please down uh, to, the mic is uh, to, uh, now mute. Turn on the mic. Uh, I learned from the presentation that it is important to protect Satoyama. How do you protect Satoyama Ridge Land? And?
Urupan, can you answer the question? Thank you. Okay, are there any question? Comment? You mentioned that one of the roles of the Satayama is to supply natural resources. What the specific resources do Satayama supply? Mm -hmm. I don't know the specific natural resources, so but um, uh, Satayama. Um, plays an important role of supplying natural resources for food and woods because maintain the biodiversity. So, yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay, are there any question or comment? Okay, if no, uh, let's move to the next uh, presentation. Thank you very much, group one. Sensei, of hmm? Can I ask something, Sensei? Uh, please. Uh, okay, please. So what? So this is uh, the question. So what is the important thing? The biodiversity in Japan, every and plant or in uh, animal or what? Because I think there is a difference between one place to another place. For example, Indonesian tropics and. Japan is uh, what you call it four season or something like that. Thank you. Hey, group one. Group one, do you have any response? We can hear the question. So once you can please. Uh, excuse me. Could you please make a question again? Can you uh, like this? So, what is the important things in biodiversity? Yeah, in biodiversity, because in my opinion, the biodiversity between Indonesian and Japan is different. Thank you very much. So, is it a general question or is it specific for the Satoyama uh, Saraikish wetland? Depend, depend, depend on the speaker how to answer this one. Ah, uh, okay. So it is okay, general one or uh, specific for the uh, Saraiki uh, wetland. I just want to know about that. It's the most important thing to maintain the biodiversity. Forest, ah, sorry, forest. Um, um, oh, ah, I think all live things, all live things can live in comfortably. So, uh, okay, in moment is thank you, thank you, Sensei, for the thank you very much answer. for your question. Okay, are there any question or comment? If no, uh, I'd like to move to the next session. Thank you very much, Group 1 of Kwansei Gaku University. And uh, next presentation uh, will be given by the uh, Group 1 of UITM. If the uh, uh, you are ready, please start your presentation. Hello everyone, my name is Noshua Damita Abdulaziz. I'm from UITM Group 1. Hello everyone, Assalamualaikum. My name is Nur Ainzairah Binti Rizwan. I'm from Group 1. Hello everyone, I am Nur Akila Binti Mamursli. Hello everyone, I'm Inta Shafinas Mita Saimi and I'm also from Group 1. Okay, we have another one pres uh, presenter which is Wanuru Sohada, also from a group one. Okay, I will um, start the presentation, which is first uh, for the introduction. 
the conservation of endangered animals and their habitats is critical for accomplishing one of the sustainable development goals by reducing biodiversity loss and also using renewable natural resources sustainably. Malaysia was thought to have up to 3,000 tigers in the 1950s. However, due to habitat loss as a result of rapid development, agriculture expansion, and as a widespread of hunting has reduced the population to fewer than 150 individuals individuals as of 2020. So, the Malaysian tiger is classified as critically endangered on the IUCN red list of threatened species and totally protected under the Wildlife Conservation Act 2010. Next. Okay, I will present um, the first molecular conservation of Pantera tigris, which is artificial insemination process. So, um, the tiger, which is Pantera tigris, is the world's largest wild cat species and was categorized as endangered animal in IUCN Red List in 2011. So they became endangered after losing an estimated 95% from their historical range due to human activities such as deforestation. So as the forest shrink and they the prey become scarce, the tiger are compelled to pursue domestic animal on which many residents uh, rely on living that resulting in tiger being killed or captured. So, however, many researchers have attempted to increase the population of this tiger species by implementing this artificial insemination, which is AI process. So, what and how does this AI technique work? This process involves collecting sperm cells from a male animal and manually depositing them into the reproductive tract of a female. Next, so this um, process, uh, this, uh, this technique is commonly used instead of natural mating in many species of animal. And these benefits include um, increased safety of the animal and producer by reducing many rates involved with breeding, such as transmission of disease, and increased population efficiency as well, as have better genetics. So, uh, next slide. Okay. Um, uh, this technique has been done by Lisbon Zoo to conserve the Siberian tiger. They used a captive nine-year-old female Siberian tiger that treated with equine chorionic codendrotropin ECG hormone and followed by 80 hours later with human chorionic gonadotropin HCG hormone to stimulate follic follicular development and also ovulation. Then, the tiger was subjected with transvaginal artificial insemination with diluted semen that obtained from an eight-year-old male tiger via electro-ejaculation. Then the female tiger was placed in an inclined position to minimize the semen reflux. After 103 days gestation, the female tiger gave birth to three healthy cubs. And this study showed that this technique can be successfully performed in tiger species to produce full term of offspring. Okay, I will pass to next presenter. Thank you. Okay, next is about cloning. Uh, so what is the conservation cloning? Cloning is a technique of reproducing an entire organism from a cell isolated from an animal while remaining genetically identical. How the cloning used in conservation? It is uh, the one type of genetic rescue and approach used to restore genetic diversity in a population and lower the risk of extinction. Next, uh, to cloning conservation technique. The first one is by making a clone, the scientists transfer the DNA from an animal somatic cell into an egg cell that has uh, its nucleus and DNA will be removed. The egg develops into an embryo that contains the same genes as the same cell donor. Then the embryo is implanted to an adult female's uterus to grow. Next, the, the advantage of uh, cloning co conservation is that clones could theoretically increase the genetic diversity of an endangered population if researchers have access the preserved DNA from many different individuals. Uh, at the very least, clones could stabilize a shrinking population. 
Uh, meanwhile, the disadvantage of cloning is that the animal cloning can lead to the reduction of genetic diversity, which compromise uh, the adaptability of species to survive changes in the environment. Animal cloning is also expensive and inefficient in comparison to sexual reproduction. Uh, the concern of cloning conservation is that the cloning process needs extensive gene editing and egg extraction, which may risk endangered species. Even if the eggs are removed and fertilized in laboratories, the endangered females are not efficient enough to carry out gestation and the quite die as a result. Uh, next is uh, the, there are many scientists think that cloning is not a viable or effective conservation strategy. Uh, to begin with, some conservationists argue that cloning does not address the underlying causes of many animal extinctions, such as hunting and habitat loss. So um, next for the in-situ conservation, is to go in-situ conservation is a method of a species uh, in its natural habitat. Uh, maintenance and recovery of the viable population of species in from their original places. So it's retained the material of uh, in its natural lo uh, natural location where it was found and it conserved the natural process of evolution, which is not uh, possible in case of the ex uh, ex situ conservation. So um, for the next one is the in situ conservation uh, of um. In situ conservation, the main in situ conservation, which is the protected area. So protected area uh, provides safe haven uh, for the endangered species, especially Panthera tigris, or known as the Malayan tiger. So it's protect from threat of the uh, of the habitat loss, poaching, and other human causes of disturbances. So this cause uh, area also help to maintain the natural habitat of these species, which are essential for their survivals. And uh, regarding the Department of Wildlife uh, and National Park Peninsula Malaysia, they have taken an initiative of the, for example, campaign Selamatkan Harimau Malaya starting 2018 after the first national uh, tiger survey for almost 75% plot area in the Peninsula Malaysia shows the decreasing amount of the Malayan tiger. Therefore, um, there are a few protected areas have been focused on to keep and maintain the natural habitat for this uh, Malayan tiger if not, uh, it according not. to if not according to uh Department of Wildlife uh, and National Park Malaysia, we lost Malayan tiger in the next five to ten years. So next slide. Okay, here are some of the protected area in Malaysia. The first one is the Taman Negara National Park. Taman Negara National Park is one of the most important tiger conservation area in Malaysia. It is um home to an estimate less than two thousand tiger, which is about 10% of the global uh, population of Malayan tiger. This park uh, is also protected by Law Wildlife Conservation Act 2010, Act 716, and has a number of programs in place to conserve tiger, including protecting tiger habitat, reducing uh, human-tiger conflict, and conducting research for educational purpose. The second one is the Endau Romping National Park in Johor. It's located in the southeast part in the peninsula Malaysia, which is the Johor. And the park is uh, also a, a UNESCO World Heritage Site and is known as a large rainforest and a diverse uh, wildlife. Next slide. Okay. Uh, the next one is the initiative underway uh, that uh, to conserve the Mal Malayan tiger in Malaysia. So Malaysia National Tiger Conservation Action Plan which is NTCAP, one of the first to give an idea and initiative program to con in order to conserve Malayan tiger in its natural habitat. So all the initiatives that have been proposed and approved by DWMP, it was collaborated with a few government agencies to make it success and uh, help to increase the number of Malayan tiger in wild by 50% uh, by 2025. All of these programs were running followed by the objective to the achieving the goal, which are the first one to secure the central uh, forest uh, Spain uh, with the strictly protected priority areas. Second one, to provide the uh, effective and a long-term protection of the tiger and their prey. The third one, uh, apply science in monitoring the effic efficacy of the conservation action and improving the knowledge of the tiger ecology. 
So uh, the enforcement program uh, as shown below is a the first one, control and patrol the poaching hotspot area, which is we call it as a ops belang. The second one, integrated operation of the National Treasury uh, with the Royal Malaysian Police uh, Perhilitan, Ops Kazana. The third one, BP3 program, collaborate among the ATM, Perhilitan, PDRM Malaysia. The fourth, uh, technology development program in the enforcement activity. And the last one, capacity building and enforcement skills. Okay, uh, so next, um, exit conservation for Pantera Tigris. Uh, biodiversity conservation technique that receiving uh, the most attention to conserve biodiversity is ex situ. Ex situ conservation is the technique of conservation of all level of biological diversity outside the natural habitat through different techniques uh, like zoo, captive breeding, aquarium, botanical garden, and gene bank. It plays key roles in communicating the issues, raising uh, awareness, and gaining widespread uh, public for conservation action and for breeding endangered species in captivity for reintroduction. The concept of ex situ conservation is fundamentally different uh, from that of in situ conservation. However, both are important complementary methods for conservation of biodiversity. Ex situ conservation includes a variety of activities uh, from managing captive population, education and raising awareness, supporting research initiatives and collaborating with in situ effort. Next. Okay, so there are uh, different technique for ex situ conservation of Pantera tigris. Uh, firstly, zoo. Uh, under the ex situ conservation program, tigers uh, placed in the zoological parks in Peninsula Malaysia are doing well, and most of the tigers uh, holding facilities in Malaysia can breed this species in captivity. Malacca Zoo, which started the captive uh, breeding program in 1982, has since then bred a total of 64 tigers, which is 22 males and 42 females. Meals. Successfully bred tigers not only able to support Malacca Zoo for its own exhibition uh, but also for other zoological parts in Malaysia. So far, 27 captive bred tigers have uh, have been adopted by uh, major zoological parts in Malaysia under Zoo Exchange Program. Uh, internationally, Malacca Zoo had uh, already exchanged nine tigers with zoological parts in Germany, Singapore, Vietnam and United States of America. Uh, next, captive breeding. Captive breeding is an integral part of the overall conservation action plan for a species that helps to prevent extinction of species, subspecies or population. Since 2005, Malacca Zoo has temporarily ceased its captive breeding program due to its maintenance costs and due to limited space. Uh, the tigers were separated to avoid mating so that the captive breed uh, population in the zoo can be controlled. Apart from breeding tigers in captivity, uh, Malacca Zoo acts as holding facility for tiger rescue from law enforcement work and which has been removed from wild due to conflict with human and livestock. Okay, next. Okay, so uh, what is cryopreservation? Uh, cryopreservation is a useful technique for the long-term storage of reproductive cell and embryos for use in human and animal access reproduction. Gamete cryopreservation in animals has significant implica implications for both disease prevention and genetic selection. Next. So there are two techniques of gamete and, uh, and embryos. Uh, first is sperm uh, cryopreservation. Most, this is the most common method of assist reproductive technique, uh, technology, which is known as ART, and it allows epid uh, epididymal sperm from dead or injured males of endangered species to be preserved and provide material for future use. And second, embryo cryopreservation. Most use, uh, this method is most used uh, for preserve preserving genetic stock and provides a faster way to recover a line following a disaster. Embryos can be stored for an extended period and the genetic material can be transported easily to collaborators hundreds of miles away. So there are three advantages of cryopreservation of sperm and embryos, which is minimize damage to biological material during low temperature of freezing, second increases generation time and allow for further contribution of genetic part of rodents natural lifespan and genetic stock is easier to transport and disease transmission goes down. 
Uh, as a conclusion, the biodiversity conservation of Malayan tiger in Malaysia is very important for maintaining the tiger population uh, in their habitat as the tiger act as an apex predator. Uh, Malayan tigers keep population of prey species in check, which is then could help to maintain the balance of ecosystem. Uh, the World Wildlife Fund Malaysia is one way to emphasize the broad nature of conservation work to prevent the decline population of Malayan tigers. This helps to mitigate threats to the tigers by dealing with illicit wildlife trafficking, uh, expanding the area protected by anti poaching actions, facilitating community cohabitation, and reducing conflict and helping preserve and protect habitats from through the promotion of better land use management that enables tiger survival. The most molecular conservation methods used by Malaysian government are in situ and at situ conservation by establishing the National Tiger Conservation Center and venture into Malayan tiger captive breeding and the conservation and research program. These two methods may help to save and recover the population of Malayan tiger. Uh, that's all from our group. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the uh, 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 interesting presentation. And uh, are there any question or comment? Okay, I have a one naive question. So the I'm interested in the uh, caption of, of the uh, US slide, so molecular conservation. So today you showed several different approaches. So uh, artificial insemination, and the cloning and the cryopreservation of gametes. So the such approach is called the uh, molecular conservation. Is it right? Uh, yes. Uh -huh. But uh, I think the exercise approach is not the molecular conservation. So exercise approach, so the zoo or aquarium or something like that. Such approach as uh, not the molecular co uh, conservation. Is my understanding right? Uh, and that's right, bro. It's why what is presented there. That, uh, uh, one is the uh, molecular, uh, uh, true molecular conservation, uh, true mm -hmm. what we call is the in situ conservation, like it was. So mm -hmm. maybe then, has been presented various kind of conservation mm -hmm. uh, through polycolors, also in, in situ, yeah, in situ conservation like uh, uh, out of the habitat, like in, okay, mm -hmm. okay, prop. Okay. Maybe a much. student, uh, anyone? The thank student can, much. yeah, thank you very much. Uh, okay, maybe the student can add some additional information about uh, detailed molecular uh, conservation. Please welcome, thank you. Okay, group one. Okay, I'd like to accept the question or comment from the uh, other uh, groups. I can ask one. Please. Uh, so I was interested in the molecular approach to animal conservation, but there are some counter uh, discussions about the ethical problems of the such conservation approach. And what do you think is the best way to uh, solve these problems and make the kind of approach uh, accurate or real one. Maybe, um, can you repeat your question? Maybe the student can and Okay, so what are the uh, good approaches? Exactly, exactly, yes. Uh, the student from my item has been presented several approaches, and then what is the best? Yeah, the best or the good one, the good approach. Okay, thank you. Please, could you say that again? I'm from UITM to answer the question. That good question among the several kind. Of, yes. Hello. Oh. Okay. Uh, hopefully that group one can answer the question. This will come any uh, approach, yeah, and then this, which one is the good one? Uh, this one is the, the question from Kwansei uh, uh, Kakuen University. 
Okay, move yes, I'm good. Yes. Okay, 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 Yeah, so that's yeah, not yeah. to uh, not uh, to make the approach popular with solving the problems of ethics. So, uh, this is my opinion. Actually, I think the best uh method is in situ conservation for me because we um uh protect the animals uh in their local original places. Which is that it can avoid any extinction, and then collaboration with the government to help uh to conserve them from any others uh poaching and everything. I think. Okay. Thank you. Okay, and I think group three of KG you have the question. So please turn on the mic. Okay. Do clone tigers have a shorter lifespan and are more prone to illness than normal tigers? Maybe can you repeat again <laughs> the question? Okay, the... could you repeat your question again? Okay. Do clone tigers have a short shorter lifespan and are more prone to illness than normal tigers? So I think he is asking about the longevity of the cloned tiger. So comparing to the wild tiger, the longevity is shorter than the uh, uh, shorter of the cloned tiger. Do you have any uh, knowledge about such question? Uh, group one of UATM, do you have any uh, response to the question? Okay, I'm so sorry. Um, did you say um about the longevity of Malayan tiger? Yeah, so I think he is asking about the uh, is a change of the longevity if the uh, tiger is generated by the cloning. Uh, um, in my opinion, um, Malayan tiger live a lot except during breeding a season. So this tiger uh, maybe uh, live up for 15 to 20 years in the natural habitat. Uh, is that answering your question? So... Group one, uh, at group three of KGU. So the how long the natural uh, the uh, wild tiger lives? Do you agree with cloning conservation? Uh, you're asking the next question. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Could you please repeat your question again? Do you agree with cloning conservation? <laughs> from what <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I think it, the question is very uh, blah uh, and ambiguous. So why do you asking about the <laughs> agreement of the cloning? <laughs> so are you asking about the ethical problem or uh, other problem? Okay, uh, maybe uh, just now maybe uh, the uh, group one has been presented that this an, an egg or maybe the the rule, yeah. The rule and the law uh, to uh, manage or to maybe relating to the cloning or any uh, biodiversity is uh, mostly uh, must uh, have an permission from the government. As long as the government, okay, maybe this one is under under uh, uh, what we call uh, the authority, the authority of the government. So meaning everything that the research or maybe the uh, including cloning that must be under a permission from the government. So that's maybe the, the egg also that just now has been presented by group one relating to this uh, kind of uh, conservation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. But uh, uh, so, the, are there any uh, uh, legal regulation of the cloning in Malaysia? Okay, Group One can answer. Maybe any uh, cloning conservation has been done in Malaysia. Please welcome. So you know, the some country uh, inhibit the cloning. So um, uh, uh, yes, yes. Uh, mm. So is it permitted in Malaysia? Okay. Uh, maybe. Uh, 
for some uh, for, for at, until now this one is just uh, maybe uh, what have student has been presented that uh, various kind of uh, uh, conservation method uh, for wildlife uh, can uh, can be can be uh, done but so far for uh, Malaysian maybe for exit to and in but maybe I think for chlorophyll uh, our plan uh, relating to permission must be in the process maybe I think for the for the real cloning is not yet uh, implemented for 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 the time being yeah but this one in the future if uh, the the like Malaysian tiger is really really in danger and then really will uh, disappear maybe this cloning may be will be one uh, method that can be uh, maybe apply in the future. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Okay, thank you very much. So are there any question or comment? Okay, if no, let's yes, take yes, a break. Yes, yes. Huh? sorry. Okay, okay. I'm a member of Group 4, I am now zero. And uh, so uh, you and uh, the, the presentation mentioned about the cloning and the cryo preserving. Uh, it is a great way to preserving the um, fire. Um, but so in Indonesia and cryo preserving and cloning is already used in practical. The uh, technology is already used in Indonesia. Uh, excuse me, the uh, presenter is a uh, come from the uh, Malaysia University, so oh, not oh, sorry. Indonesia. Ma Malaysia, sorry. I think the the answer is, has been uh, the same with previous uh, question. Mm -hmm. Just now has been answered. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Are there any question or comment? No. Okay. Uh, okay. So KG Group Two, please down the mic. Okay. Uh, we are Group Two. Uh, thank you for the great presentation. Yeah, artificial insemination and cloning and cryo preservation was very interesting, very interesting idea. But I have a one question. And uh, how does the Malaysia government promote the better land use management that enable to the tiger will be enable to reap? Uh, could you please answer the question, Group 1 of UITM? I'm so sorry, can you repeat the question? Because I cannot hear it clearly. Uh, so, uh, Group 2, KG, could you please repeat your question again? Okay. So, how does the uh, Malaysia government promote the better land use for Malaysian tiger? Okay, for the Group 1, so how uh, gov Malaysian government, yeah? promote the, for the Malaysian tiger conservation. I think like that one is the question. Yeah. Yeah, how to promote uh, the promotion and so support has been done by Malaysia. What kind of promotion maybe? Please welcome group one. Sorry. No, no, no. I see he is, uh, he is uh, uh, asking, uh, uh, asking the uh, group one to answer, uh, answer your question. Okay, on the group one, maybe I think uh, many, many, many type, yeah, many uh, effort has been done by the government. To, uh, for example, firstly, uh, using uh, by uh, some uh, uh, the the popular people like the wife of the previous minister, prime ministers. So uh, she presented on behalf of the government to promote how to protect the, our Malaysian tigers. So to educate the people and to promote and to uh, uh, bring some people to know that our tiger is now is in endangered and then so please uh, and then they uh, uh, come up with some uh, agenda and strategies strategies to uh, together to to conserve and to protect our uh, 
uh, with Malaysian Tiger in Malaysia. That's maybe one kind of promotion has been done. Of course, of course, uh, we have done also through uh, radio, multimedia, and television, and of course YouTube and so on so forth. If you open YouTube, you can see the Malaysian pro, uh, Tiger. How to protect and let's to pro, let's protect our uh, Malaysian Tigers that uh, used used by uh, maybe promote by uh, Malaysian uh, Prime Minister wife. Yeah, you can open on YouTube. Well, that one is one uh, method. The other is maybe to through the the school, and of course through the uh, yes uh, uh, the education uh, program. Yeah, that's one is one kind of uh, promotion also. That's maybe we, you can answer maybe uh, by, uh, on behalf of group one. Thank you. Thank you, group two. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments? Okay, if no, oh, let's take a break. Okay, I'd, uh, I'd like to have a, a 15 minutes break. So please come back here at 15, 20, okay? Okay, let's take a break. Uh, thank you very much for nice presentations. Arigato. Terima kasih. Terima kasih. Sama sama. So next, the uh, next presentation is suppo uh, supposed to be given by a group three of KGU. So uh, uh, during waiting for the UNDIP group one, uh, KGU group three, uh, uh, could you please make a, a presentation? Okay, please, Sensei. Yeah, Think okay. The, the group. Okay, then uh, KGU group three, please uh, start. Hello, we are group three of Yotaro Sumi. Hanayamaguchi, Mafu Sase, Tsukushito, Fujimanami, and in myself, Renosuke Hori. In this presentation, we would like to talk about tree cotton and how to use harvested wood. This is the outline of our presentation. First of all, we would like to talk about the failing, failing process. The first step is failing is to decide the direction in which the tree is to be filled. The receiving end should be cut 30 to 45 degrees in the direction the tree is to be filled. The length of the cut should be about a quarter of the tree's diameter. Then make a trailing cut on the opposite side. The trailing edge is the cut made on the opposite side of the receiver. The cut should be about one half the diameter of the tree. The trick is to sew it well at the point, facing close attention to the angel. If the sew is not inserted properly, the blade will get cut and the tree will become increasingly difficult to fail. Finally, secure the, secure the this surrounding area and fail the tree. Afterwards, the tree is shredded and put away where it will not damage the wetland. As, as, it, as it is not good to leave the tree on the spot. It was a new and interesting experience for us. After actually filling the tree, we felt that tree looked even bigger after it, with, it was filled than the tree we had seen from a distance. Also, it was more difficult to carry the tree after it had been filled, shredding it and carrying it away. Then it was to fill it. Also, the trees were so big that it was difficult to dispose of them. Finally, watch the video of the rocking. <laughs> <laughs> in the following, we are going to explain why we have to cut down the tree in the first place and then discuss the problems with tree failing we briefly mentioned here. We first would like to discuss why trees must be cut down in Satoyama. When you hear the word tree cutting, 
you may have a negative image of destruction of nature. However, in Sarayama, cutting down tree is indispensable. In Sarayama, human hands should be involved in order to keep species alive in it. This is true in Sarayaki Westland, too. And one of the activities human hand is involved with is to cut down trees in the wetland. This photo shows the largest wetland in Sarayke. As you can see, the wetland is home for a large number of low trees and grasses. However, due to low nutrient content, many of these species are on the verge of extinction. On top of this, as the trees in wetland grow, those trees and grasses are further decreasing in number because of the lack of sunlight. Therefore, tall trees have to be cut down to protect the low trees and grasses. Large herbaceous plants such as Numagaya are also a natural enemy of wetland. The proliferation of large herbaceous plants is destro destroying small herbaceous plants. Incidentally, it is said that in the past, the wetland was unintentionally preserved because the people used to cut down the trees to feed their cows and trees to use as materials. However, this is not true. Those people were aware of how tall trees are in the wetland affect other species. Saraike wetland is called semi-natural because it is mentioned, maintained by human hands and nature, and people live together in harmony. However, the issue is that it is difficult to find a balance between protecting nature and wetland. Sandwood was peeled up after tree clearing experience and used to be used in various ways. Growing mushroom, cut a thin wood into pieces of about one meter, make some holes and plant fungus. Shiitake mushrooms can be produced the year after planting the fungus. In fact, we experienced harvesting shiitake mushroom in this way. With the chip, sandwood is finely crushed and reused as chips. Chips are used in gardens to make them look better. And because they have cushioning properties, they are used in children's playgrounds. However, reusing sandwood is not an easy task. In the first place, the transportation cost of wood is high and it cannot be moved from the marsh and has to wait for it to rot. We are now moving to describe the reuse of cut down wood and its various uses. While, while a deforestation is necessary to meet the demand of our society, it also has a significant environment impact. Therefore, we must use wood in a sustainable way. This presentation will discuss the use of deforest wood and its use for wood and furniture. Wood from tree cut down can be used to sustain its value. It can be used as a biomass energy and use it as fuel in power plants. This reduces dependence on fossil fuel and promoted the use of renewable energy society, uh, sources. It is also sustainable for recycling and may be used as reclaimed uh, wood. It is used in the uh, manufacture of building materials, materials, uh, pallets, Furniture it is helping to <clears throat> conserve the uh, resources and wood is used 
in landscapes designed for <clears throat> gardens and parks. Wood is also used to create beautiful space in harmony with the environment, such as garden trees, lakes, and flower beds. Wood produced heat through combustion and it's used as a food for domestic and industrial process. This reduces the use of fossil fuel and greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, harvest wood is used as material for furniture uh, manufacturing. Sustainable forest ma uh, man management, management and the use of recycled materials allow us to produce furniture in an envir environment uh, friendly way. And harvested wood is also used for furniture use and recycling. For example, old wooden doors and floor boards can be used to create unique table and shivers. Mm. Use and diverse use of harvest wood are important for our su sustainable futures. Using wood as a renewable energy source, recycling or for use in furniture allow us to conserve, conserve forest and use resources and more effectivity. We should aim for society that we, uh, exist with abundant natures by using wood in an um, environmentally friendly way and ensuring the sustainable breeds of forest resources. We continue to give examples of how to use harvested trees. We have explained how harvested tree is reused in the Saraiki wetland and other wetland areas in Japan. Now, we expand our horizon to suggest how people in general can be involved with the nature of Satoyama and other wetland. Because we felt that there is little recognition of wetland use by people outside. One suggestion we would like to mention is to use harvested trees for public transportations. For example, straps, decorations, and seats in the train. There are two reasons for this plan. First, using of harvested trees for public transportation can make many people aware of the existence of Satoyama and wetland. Second, using natural materials like wood chips or wood parts is to sort to reduce the amount of plastic, which is currently used in many public transportations. There are concerns that making such parts requires a lot of money and high technology. And we also need understanding and support from public institutions. But we believe that introducing harvested wood to public will lead many people to become aware of the existence of Satoyama and wetland. Next, we suggest another use of harvested trees for protective fences of roads. In Europe countries and the US, using woods for road facilities is very common thing. It may be difficult for us to make equipment from only harvested trees. Utilizing harvested trees for road facilities will lead people attention of nature sustainability. We have suggested two ways of using a harvested tree. If you think about the cost and the technology, time for road facilities, our plants are one of the most economical but practical, practical ways of making fences. In the next section, we will suggest one more easier to be realized.
um, is that question? No? Okay, I will continue. And we have suggested two ways of using wood chips. However, they are expected to be implemented on a large scale. Otherwise, energy production would not be sufficient. So we have suggested something that can easily be realized with wood chips in our local communities. How about conducting craft classes for children? When we visited Saiki Veteran, we learned that there was an open event for Sanda students. In the same way, by not holding an event to tour the wetland for children and then to have the activity of working with cutting timber. Seeing their creatures living in Saiki Wetland will be a good experience for children to learn about the Saiki Wetland. On the other hand, children get tired of simply listening to adults. Children are very interested in souvenirs and things they can experience in person. In fact, when I was little, I liked crafting very much. The work should not be difficult, so it might be good to have a pencil stand just to hollow out the inside of a wooden doll just to stick it together with a glue. In addition to activities made by children, it may also be a good idea to sell key links and some goods made of cutting trees made by guardians, local people, or our university students. This will give new life to the woods that has lost its way. This suggestion is relatively in inexpensive and can be done immediately. By reusing harvested trees to pr protect the basin veterans in this way, this may contribute to four give everyone quality education, seven give everyone energy and clean, and fifteen protect runs richness. We learned a lot through thinking about how to reuse harvesting trees in order to solve the pro problem of these cutting cut down trees. Isn't it important to lead many people to become aware of the current situation? Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you very much, Group 3 of KGU. Now the paper is open for discussion. Are there any questions or comments? Uh, hello, hi. Uh, I would like to ask one question. How does the use of cut trees in wetlands affect biodiversity and the overall health of the ecosystem? Okay, in my opinion, we have to cut down the trees to protect the diversity of creatures. So these activities help the creatures to protect their diversity. So um, maybe it's not clear answers, but it's our answer. Ah, okay, thank you. So are there any questions or comments? Uh, I would like to ask a question. Um, so my question is, uh, how do different wet wetland types and geographical locations uh, influence the impact and potential benefits of using cut trees? Sorry, what did you say? Um, you said the uh, use cutting down trees between in veteran and where did you say? No, uh, I know my, my question is, uh, how do different wetland types uh, affect the uh, impacts and potential of the reusing cut trees, the different location? Um, I'm sorry, I don't, we don't have clear answer, but maybe it depends on the veteran. It's not specificity. Uh, maybe it depends on the place, but we don't have specific information about it. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Hey, are there any question or comment? May I ask question, please? Oh, please. Okay. So, what alternative practices exist for many? 
managing cut trees in wetlands that promotes uh, ecosystem conservation and restoration. Sorry, could you say it again? What are the alternative practices exist for managing cut trees in wetlands uh, that can promote ecosystem conservation and restoration? The alternative practices exist in managing cut trees in wetlands. Group three, can you understand this question? Yeah, we understand, but okay. we are thinking about the answer. Maybe the our the different group member said in presentation, but um, if we cut the trees, the right can can go into the ground, so the ground can and the their their creatures can be can live can remain so it's good effect to diversity of creatures by cutting trees well i'm sorry but can you simplify that um sorry wait a moment uh, I'm sorry for waiting your question. Uh, in my opinion, uh, we think we think that reusing uh, harvested tree is in the other location from the forest or wetland. So we don't uh, care. Uh, no, no, no. We think we don't have to worry about the ecosystem in the wetland or forest because we use we think uh reusing harvested tree in the other place like a uh, road or in the public transportation or in the workshop so uh, we we separate uh the place where we use harvested trees uh far from wetland or satoyama is it uh, uh is it uh one of the answer for your question uh, do you mean like selective logging like you select certain types of trees to cut down is that what you mean so if we asking... select and check uh trees which we need to cut down for for the wetland ecosystems. So we we uh, select. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So the uh, eh, eh, So are there any question or comment? No. Uh yes, I have a one question. Oh, please. Okay. So what is the initiative and regulation that taken by the government to prevent the deforestation by cutting the trees. So you mean that uh, uh, there are there any regu uh, governmental regulation of the cutting trees? Is it a question of you? Yes, the regulation uh, that initiated by government to prevent uh, the deforestation by uh -huh. cutting the trees. Okay, group three, could you please answer the question? Okay, I think um, there is no regulation from the government. It's only to volunteer. We did it by volunteer, I think. We didn't dis um search it, so maybe it's um it's not answer, but mm, but I think the Sanda City uh, has a regulation to maintain the uh, so the it is not directly related to the cutting tree but the uh, Sanda City has a regulation of the maintain the uh, biodiversity in the wetland so the I think the cutting tree is uh, related to the ma maintenance of the biodiversity in the wetland so it, it is a not a direct way but uh, I think the there is a uh, regulation of the uh, so city level, is it right? Group three. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> we cannot search it. Um, so 
we cannot find it. Thank you. Okay, is the question enough for you? Okay, are there any question or comment? Okay, okay, uh, then uh, thank you very much, Group 3 of KGU. Uh, let's move to the uh, uh, next presentation. And I'd like to call the, uh, the uh, okay, UITM Group 2, are you ready? Uh, if you are ready, please start the presentation. Assalamualaikum and hi, uh, my name is Atira Marsha Binti Azizur Rashidi and uh, for this topic, my my team will present about the molecular techniques in conserving biodiversity of ancient elephant. Uh, my name is Siti Ramay Sara. Hi, my name is Nisa Karmila with Kamar Zaman. I am from UITM Group 2. Hi, my name is Nora Akila Binti Nazri. I am from UITM Group 2. Uh, next. Can I start? Yeah. Oh, please. Okay. In the dense forest of Peninsula Malaysia, Asian elephants, once widespread, now face endangerment and vulnerability. Recognizing the urgency, their status was elevated to totally protected species under the Wildlife Conservation Act in 2010. Their population decline can be attributed to forest conversions, cooling, and human conflicts. As of 2011, the remaining elephants' uh, populations are primarily found on the eastern side of the Titiwangsa Range, while states like Perlis, Penang, Selangor, Melaka, and Negeri Sembilan have lost their elephants due to translocations and conflicts. The future of these magnificent creatures lies in concerted conservation efforts and sustainable coexistence between humans and wildlife. Uh, in Malaysia, Asian elephants face a grave threat as their homes, the forests, are disappearing due to land conversions for agriculture like palm oil and rubber. This habitat loss uh, this habitat loss puts them in danger and increase conflicts with humans. Urgent actions is needed to protect these magnificent creatures and ensure they have a safe place to call home. Next. Borneo. Borneo is still home to large areas of forest, uh, which provides the real hope that a healthy wild elephant population uh, has a sustainable future. The elephants of Borneo are known to migrate between Malaysia and the Indonesian province of Kalimantan. Uh, next. Uh, now currently, the Department of Wildlife and National Parks is working closely with the WWF um, to ensure the survival of Borneo's elephant. Next. A domesticated elephant uh, is defined as an elephant that has been tamed and trained to live and work alongside humans. Uh, in Malaysia, the use of domesticated elephants can be traced back to the era of the Malacca Sultanate, which existed from the 15th to the 16th century. In 1974, domesticated elephants were revived due to the requirement of elephant management units, the EMUs, whereby six Mahout and four Kunkis elephants were brought over from Assam to train ranges on how to control and capture wild elephants. Next. The domestic elephants serve various purposes, such as uh, transportation. Historically, uh, elephants were commonly used as transportation in dense forests. Next one is logging. Domestic elephants were used to haul and transport heavy logs from remote areas. Next one is cultural and ceremonial events and tourism. In modern times, domesticated elephants are used in tourism industries such as giving rides and interacting with tourists. The fifth one is conservation and research, which are for studying and protecting wild elephant populations and their habitat. And the last one is anti-poaching, whereby trained elephants have been used to assist in anti-poaching operation and security patrols. Next. Okay, the next is the Kuala Ganda National Elephant Conservation Center. The Kuala Ganda National Elephant Conservation Center, also known as the Elephant of Rene Sanctuary, is located in the small village of Lancham. This center was established in 1989 by the De Department of Wildlife and National Parks. It is a base for the elephant relocation team, which started in 1974. This sanctuary is responsible to track capture and relocate uh, wild elephants whose habitats have been damaged by development to protected areas such as the national parks. Uh, next, 
So the aims for the Kuala Gada National Elephant Conservation Center are to promote the public awareness of the traits, pressures, and flight of elephants in Malaysia. They support research on elephants' relocation and conservation while also acting as a sanctuary for tame and wild elephants that are needed needed a treatment. Next. So now let's move on to the activities at Kuala Ganda Elephant Sanctuary, uh, which are hand feeding the elephants, bathing with elephants, watching the elephant show, and lastly, uh, the, the tourists can visiting the elephants museum. Next, we move on to another, uh, to another elephant sanctuary in Malaysia, which is in Sungai Ketiar. Sek this is the second elephant sanctuary that is located in Sungai Ketiar ne nearby Tasik Kenyar, Terengganu, Malaysia. And this elephant sanctuary has been established in 2007 and the park is quite small compared to the main one in Kuala Ganda. This sanctuary is responsible to capture and relocating wild elephants. There are two uh, elephants that are... Uh, that uh, live in the uh, sanctuary named Surya and Shahil. And these two uh, elephants are specially trained to help and relocate captured wild elephants in the area. So for the visitors activities, there are, there are many activities that we can do at in Sungai Ketiar Elephant Sanctuary. We just can um, do some elephant feeding and also elephant riding, which is only available in certain times. Meanwhile, for the workers' responsibility in Sungai Ketiar, the people that work at Sungai Ketiar are doing a wonderful job because when they hear um, uh, the reports of poachers in the area, they track them down and bring them to the authorities. And also, local residents can call them whenever an elephant is sighted with, within a habitat area so that they can relocate the elephant. Okay, now let's move on to the molecular techniques in conserving Asian elephants. The molecular techniques are five with our embry embryo transfer, paternity analysis, the artificial insemination, in vitro fertilization, and lastly, the cryopreservation. I will explain about embryo transfer. Embryo transfer is a crucial step in the reproductive management uh, of Asian elephants. It involves surgically transferring fertile embryos from a super ovulated donor elephant to a carefully selected recipient elephant based on age, fertility, and suitability as a mother. Uh, embryo transfer in Asian elephants can be performed through the transvaginal method using a vaginal speculum or the laparoscopic method with, with a small incision in the uterine wall. The transvaginal method is commonly used and highly successful. Another experimental approach involves uh, an artificial uterus for embryo incubation, but it is still being developed. Okay, now let's move on to the transvaginal method. The procedure is typically performed uh, under general anesthesia to ensure the safety of all animals uh, that are involved. A small incision is made in the uterine wall of the recipient elephants and the fertilized embryo is carefully placed inside. The uterus is then uh, closed with a suturus or glue. The embryo transfer is a challenging and quite a complex process that requires a very, very careful planning, skilled surgery, and experienced staff. Uh, however, when conducted correctly, uh, it can be a highly effective method for conserving Asian elephants' population and maintaining their genetic diversity. So, for the advantages of embryo transfer, uh, embryo transfer is a valuable conservation tool for Asian elephant, preserving the genetic material and addressing the low breeding rates. It also enhances the genetic diversity, facilitates faster breeding rates, and promotes healthier offsp offspring, reducing the risk of inherited disorders. Next. Moving on to the disadvantages of the embryo transfer. Firstly, it is very costly because it requires specialized equipment, skilled surgeons, and also experienced staff. And then it also technical complexity because the, uh, the procedure is very complex. And thirdly, it's the ethical concerns. This raises ethical concerns, including questions about the use of animal life as donors and recipients and the potential risk to these animals. Next, I will explain about paternity analysis. 
In this realm of wildlife conservation, DNA opportunity testing is a powerful genetic technique that unlocks crucial insights into breeding dynamics, uh, genetic contributions, and lineage within animal populations. By comparing the DNA of offspring to potential fathers, scientists can accurately determine the biological father, aiding in understanding mating preferences, preserving uh, genetic integrity, and promoting the long-term viability of species. This game-changing technology equips conservationists with vital knowledge to safeguard the diversity and future of our precious wildlife. Next. DNA paternity uh, testing unveils a fascinating scientific process. First, DNA samples like blood, tissue, hair, or faces are collected from the mother, potential fathers, and offspring. Genetic markers, unique and inherited from both parents, are then selected for analysis. Next, DNA profiling commences where targeted markers are amplified using PCR, and genotyping follows analyzing the amplified DNA fragments to determine marker size or sequence. Through statistical analysis, the likelihood of paternity is calculated. To ensure accuracy, validation and confirmation occur through repeated analysis and additional samples. This uh, intricate process empowers conservationists with invaluable insights, uh, fostering the preservation of genetic integrity and promoting the viability of diverse wildlife populations. Next. These are the advantage and disadvantage of paternity analysis. As for the advantage, it provides insight into breeding dynamics, genetic contribution, and lineage within a population, help in managing population demographics and avoiding inbreeding, assist in promoting genetic diversity conservation efforts. As for the disadvantages, it requires high-quality DNA samples, limited marker diversity in some populations, complex breeding dynamics, and paternity analysis may require specialized laboratory facilities, technical expertise, and can be time-consuming and costly. Next, uh, as for the application, paternity analysis uh, is a powerful genetic tool, find numerous applications across various fields. In livestock breeding, it enables the selection of superior traits and enhances breeding programs. In forensic applications, it aids in solving mysteries and establishing biological relationships are crucial to justice and captive breeding programs benefit from paternity analysis by ensuring genetic diversity and mitigating inbreeding risk. For the conservation biology, it embraces this technique to understand, to understand breeding dynamics, preserve genetic integrity and promote the survival of endangered species. Lastly, Wildlife management relies on paternity analysis to inform effective conservation uh, strategies and safeguard the biodiversity of our natural world. This versatile method plays a vital role in unraveling lineage and bolstering efforts to protect and sustain uh, diverse populations of life on our planet. Thank you. Next. Now let's continue with the in vitro fertilization. Uh, the, the second molecular technique that we use are to conserve Asian elephant is in vitro fertilization. In vitro fertilization is a reproductive technology that involves the process of fertilizing an egg with sperm outside the body. The process involves the injection of elephants with frozen sperm. One such technique is called uh, intrauterine artificial insemination, AI. In contrast, IVF techniques can also be used in cloning, animal breeding, and genetic research. Next. Okay, next, moving on to the process of in vitro fertilization. The first step is the ovarian simulation. Uh, the female elephant is administered hormonal treatment to stimulate her ovaries and promote the development of multiple follicles, each containing an oocyte. Once the follicles have reached an appropriate size, or site retrieval is performed. This is typically done under ultrasound guidance uh, where a veterinarian uh, retrieves the oocyte from the elephant's ovaries using a needle and aspiration technique. Uh, next, the sperm collection process. Semen is collected from male elephants usually through electro-ejaculation, which involves uh, electrical stimulation to induce ejaculation and collect the semen. The first step is the insemination. The collected oocytes are then incubated in a culture medium 
and a specific number of sperm cells are added to each oocyte for fertilization. The oocyte and sperm are then co-cultured in vitro, uh, which allowing the fertilization to occur. Then after fertilization occur, the embryos are cultured in the laboratory for several days, during which they undergo development and division. Lastly, uh, once the embryos have reached an appropriate stage of development, they are transferred into the reproductive tract of a recipient female elephant. Uh, this can be done through surgical or non-surgical techniques. Then continue with the example of successful IVF treatments for elephants. The first one is Pang Sao, a 26 years old a Thai elephant pregnant after IVF treatment at Maisa Elephant Camp. And the next one is Darius Tonga, a also 26 years old uh, elef African elephant that has to impregnate with frozen sperm in Vienna Zoo. Then we continue with the advantages and disadvantages of in vitro fertilization. For the advantages, IVF enables the expansion and, ex and preservation of genetic variation among all the elephant population. Then IVF also helps in the treatments of elephant infertility. Additionally, IVF makes it possible to breed endangered or treated elephants in order to increase the number of elephants. For these advantages, IVF procedures can be expensive and require specialized facilities and equipment. Then, there is potential harm to the animal's evolutionary process or the idea that artificial breeding interferes with the normal reproductive cycles. And lastly, the IVF success rate can vary and not all attempts result in successful pregnancies or healthy offspring. Okay, so the next method that we're going to discuss is artificial insemination. Artificial insemination is a reproductive technique that involves the introduction of sperm into the reproductive tract of a female animal without the natural mating. AI has been successfully applied in Asian elephants to aid in their reproductive management and the conservation efforts. In the case of Asian elephants, AI uses an endoscope guided catheter and transrectal ultrasound to deliver the semen into the anterior vagina or cervix of the female elephant. This technique relies on the identification of double LH search to time insemination. It has been used to impregnate 12 female elephants at the National Zoological Park between the 1998 and 2002. Next. Okay, so. The methods in artificial insemination, the first step is hormone monitoring. This is done by uh, taking a blood samples of female elephant and examine for, to monitor their hormone levels for tracking if she is ovulating. The next step is semen collection. Uh, electro ejaculation is used to gather the semen from the male elephant. In order to get the male elephant to ejaculate, a rectal prop that applies an electrical stimulation to the prostate glands is used. The next step is semen preparation. The quality of the semen assessed following the collection. It is then diluted and cleaned from any impurities, which followed by the process of insemination. The female elephant is confined and drug transrectal ultras uh, ultrasonography is then used to guide an endoscope guided catheter into the cervix of after being put into the elephant's vagina. The last step is post-insemination monitoring. The female elephant is monitored closely. The hormone levels are tracked and ultrasound is performed to confirm the pregnancy. Next. So for the advantages and the disadvantages of the artificial insemination, the first advantage of AI is the genetic diversity. AI allows an introduction of new genetic material into a population which helps increase the genetic diversity and also reduce the risk of inbreeding. Next is reduce stress. AI can be less stressful as it eliminates the need for direct contact between the male and female elephant. The third one is increased breeding opportunities. AI can be used to breed animals that are not compatible for natural breeding due to behavioral and physical issues. As for the disadvantages, the first one is cost. AI can be quite expensive as it, uh, as it requires specialized uh, equipment and personnel. The second one is low success rate. 
AI success rate can be lower than the natural breathing, uh, particularly if the semen quality is poor or the female has reproductive issues. And the third one is ethical concern. Some people may have ethical concerns about the use of AI in animals, particularly if it involves sedation and other invasive procedures. Okay, next. So for the application of artificial insemination, the first application is genetic management. The new genetic material introduced through the artificial insemination can help increase the gen genetic diversity and reduce the risk of inbreeding. Second one is conservation. AI can be used to help conserve the endangered elephants by increasing the genetic diversity of captive populations. And the third one is disease prevention. Artificial insemination can help prevent disease certain diseases that can be transmitted through natural breathing. Next. Uh, next. Next, yeah. we move on to the cryopreservation. Cryopreservation is a process of preserving cells, tissues, or organs at a very low temperature, typically below negative 130 degrees Celsius. This is to maintain the viability and functionality for future use. So the process involves the addition of cryoprotective agents protect the cells from damage during freezing and thawing. Cryopreservation is used in various fields, including medicines, biotechnology, and research to store cells and tissue for future use in treatments, experiments, or other applications. So there's two cryopreservation. One is embryo cryopreservation and sperm cryopreservation. And the importance of this cryopreservation is that it allows for the long-term storage of genetic material such as sperms and embryos, preserving the genetic diversity of elephant populations. Moving on to the process of the embryo cryopreservation, firstly, the embryos are collected at an early developmental stage, and this and, and it will be subjected to the cryoprotectant solutions such as dimethyl sulfoside, glycerol, ethylene glycol, or propylene glycol. And then it will undergo rapid cooling called vitrification. Vitrification is a rapid cooling process that transforms a substance into a glass-like non-crystalline state by avoiding the formation of ice crystals. Vitrified embryos will store in a, in a liquid nitrogen at ultra-low temperatures and thought embryos can be transferred to a recipient elephant's uterus for development. Similar to the embryo cryopreservation, sperm cryopreservation also will gather the samples from the semen uh, that are collected from the male elephants and also the semen is mixed with the cryoprotectant solution. At a control rate, the freezing technique is used to slowly cool the mixture and then this cool mixture is stored in a liquid nitrogen at a very low temperature. Cryopreserved sperms and can also be used for artificial insemination. Moving on to the advantage and disadvantage of the cryopreservation. For the advantage, cryopreservation will facilitate the exchange of genetic material between different elephants' population that will help to manage and maintain genetic, genetic diversity. Cryopreserved sperm can be used for artificial insemination, enabling breeding programs, and increased reproductive success. Embryos can be transposed transported to different locations, allowing for genetic rescue and enhancing breeding programs. As for, this, as for the disadvantages, cryopreservation techniques for elephant can be complex and require specialized equipment and expertise. Cryopreservation may cause some loss of viability in sperm and embryos, reducing the success rates of assisted reproductive procedures. For the application, Cryopreservation can be applied in the conservation program, assisted breeding, research, and genetic resources. As for the conservation programs, this plays a crucial role in conserving endangered elephant population, preserving their genetic diversity, and aiding in population management efforts. Assisted breeding, the cryopreserved sperm can be used to overcome reproductive challenges and enhance breeding success, especially in cases where natural may think it's not possible or successful. Cryopreserved genetic materials can also be used in genetic and research sources 
because it provides a valuable resource for studying elephant genetics, population dynamics, and contributing to scientific research. So in conclusion, among all of these pre preservation techniques that we, molecular techniques that we have mentioned above, we, it all have pros, cons, and also its own strengths. And the majority of these techniques have a low success rate. However, in Malaysia, we have applied uh, the technique of uh, in vitro fertilization, artificial insemination, and also embryo transfer. That's all from our group. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much uh, uh, for interesting uh, talk. So now the paper is open for discussion. Are there any questions or comment? Okay, I have a two uh, questions. One of them is uh, my personal interest. So the domestication of animals often changes the behavior and the morphology of the animal. Uh, so the uh, uh, my question is, the, are there any difference uh, between the uh, domesticated uh, uh, elephants and the wild elephants? So the one of the differences, uh, so the domesticated animals uh, become, uh, the, there's a tendency that the domesticated animals become less aggressive and uh, uh, more obedient to humans. So uh, are there uh, such a difference? Uh, if you uh, know such uh, information, could you please tell me? Uh, sorry, uh, do you, what you're trying to ask is uh, what are the other difference than uh, what you have mentioned? So the difference uh, between the uh, uh, domesticated elephants and the wild elephants. So the so, for example, the uh, domesticated elephants are uh, less aggressive and more obedient to humans comparing to the uh, wild elephants. Uh, are there uh, such a tendency? Uh, yeah, if you know. <laughs> uh, correct me if I'm wrong. If I'm not mistaken, uh, captivated animals are less, uh, they have less survival skills in the mm -hmm. wild compared to the wild species. So uh, if they were released into the natural population, they have a low survival rate. Mm -hmm. And um, another possible, another possible uh, outcome could be the difference between uh, native captive animals and the wild animal is that uh, some of the captive animals, uh, since they are bred uh, in, in situ, so uh, their genetic variation could be different from the wild species. Uh, some of them may consist of uh, an advanced, more advanced um, characteristic, which uh, if it were exposed to the natural environment, it could become a, a invasive species which um, other words is alien species. Uh, so basically it may outcompete the native species, uh, wild species uh, in the natural habitat, which may lead to the extinction. Uh, so my point is, uh, one is they probably have a advanced um, genetic variation, which leads to invasive species. The other one is uh, they have lower survival traits in the wild compared to the wild. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And I have another question. So the uh, about the uh, cryo preservation. So mm -hmm. how long uh, the <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> gametes in the cold environment is uh, uh, effective effect uh, i don't know how to say <laughs> uh, uh can be uh, used for the preservation uh, 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 can you understand my question so the uh, uh, even in the cold environment uh, the uh, 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 so the gametes may be degraded so mm -hmm. uh, my question is how long the uh, 
to geometry in the uh, uh, cooled environment is uh, uh, to, uh, uh, I don't know how to say uh, active or, uh, yeah. How long can it uh, stay viable? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, may I answer the question? Uh, please. For the sperm cryopreservation, uh, for the successful cryo uh, with uh, cryopreservation with the proper techniques, the frozen sperm can be remain viable for many years because uh, there are some studies that suggest that uh, sperm frozen uh, using the modern techniques can be mm -hmm. stored effectively, effectively for up to several decades. Mm -hmm. Compared to the... Uh, or all site cryopreservation or the embryo cryopreservation is that uh, the survival rates of eggs after towing is generally lower than the sperm, uh, despite the advances in the cryopreservation techniques. And it has uh, studies have shown that eggs frozen using the cryopreservation techniques can remain viable for only several uh, years, but the optimal storage duration may vary for different samples. Do I answer your questions? Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, and uh, group three of KGU, uh, I think you have a questions. This one is from Unsut. <laughs> okay, please. All right, from Unsut. Okay, please. Yes, Rafi Anmar. Okay. Uh, uh, um, this method has been implement, implement in Malaysia or just a suggestion? And if so, how is the result? Ah, thank you. Okay, uh, may I answer the question? So for the several techniques that we have discussed uh, earlier, uh, there are uh, two techniques which are embryo transfer and in vitro fertilization that had been um, have been done in Malaysia. Uh, for in vitro fertilization, um, the Borneo Eloquent Century, uh, BES, which is located in Sabah, the Borneo one, in Malaysia, uh, have been actively involved in research and conservation efforts for the Borneo Eloquent, uh, which are the subspecies of the Asian Eloquent. Um, in study in, in 2019, uh, BES successfully produced the world's first Bornean elephant embryo through the IVF, and this milestone marked a, a significant step towards helping the conserve and endangered Bornean elephants. Um, although the development of IVF techniques uh, is a complex process, um, which involves the treatment of hormone to stimulate the ovarian follicle development, uh, but these techniques um, help promise for assisting in elephant conservation efforts. Uh, particularly for individuals that may have reproductive challenges or for genetic management purpose. Do I answer your question? Okay. Okay, Thank so you. then, uh, okay, so group three of KGU, please. Okay, uh, what is the best, uh, what is the best method? Okay. Um, maybe uh, the question is among uh, more many uh, methods that you presented just now, which is the best, which is which one the best? Please welcome group two, UITM. Um, I think the best method is embryo transfer. Uh, and why? Why? Why that one? Siti Nur Mai Sarah. Why? You can continue explanation. Okay. Um, I think what uh, Sarah chose embryo transfer is because uh, embryo transfer involves the process of uh, transferring a fertilized egg into the into the uh, elephant. So, um, compared to the other methods, uh, the other methods, um, they use like they insert a. For example, artificial insemination, they insert a sperm into the female reproductive tract or system. Uh, however, in embryo transfer, they transfer an embryo that has been fertilized and inserted into the animals. Therefore, I think uh, 
embryo transfer has a high probability of the female elephant to be impregnated compared to the other um, methods. Because uh, we have we know that the embryo that has been transferred is ha that has been fertilized. So we know that we have higher chances of the female elephant to be pregnant compared to just insert the sperm and let the natural uh natural productive system to take place. Okay, thank you. I think oh, that's what Sarah trying to say. Thank you. Hey, thank Did I you. answer your question? Group three. Are you okay? Thank you so much. <laughs> How much does it cost to conserve each elephant in artificial insemination? Sorry? How much does it cost to conserve each elephant? Oh. In so you artificial mean the cost? Insemination? Yeah. Oh. I, uh, I'm sorry, but I have not read the amount of costs needed for artificial insemination, but uh, it is very highly cost because we require an advanced technology, um, like a very experienced person to to carry out the, the procedures. Therefore, we need to pay higher fee for the person to conduct the procedure. We know that it's very expensive, but I'm sorry, I don't have the the exact amount of the cost. Okay, are you okay, group three of KGU? Yeah. But okay. if you if you have found uh, any sources that stated the cost, uh, it would be great if you share with us. Okay. Okay. Group three of KGU, okay? Okay. Okay, so thank you. So are there any questions or comment? Uh, I have one more question. Please. Uh, why Asian elephants are endangered? Uh, uh, may I answer this question? <laughs> um, I think that Asian elephants are endangered due to several reasons. Uh, first, maybe habitat loss. Uh, the destruction and fragmentation of their um, natural habitat is one of the primary reasons for the decline of uh, Asian elephants. Uh, deforestation, urbanization, and conversion of forests into agricultural land have um, resulted in the loss of their feeding and breeding ground. Um, and and uh, another point, I think, because of human-elephant conflict, um, as human uh, populations expand and encroach open elephant habitats, uh, conflicts arise. Uh, elephants may raid crops, leading to uh, retaliation from farmers, which often involve killing or injuring elephants. This uh, conflict further threatens uh, Asian elephants' survival. Um, okay, that's all the points. Do I answer your question, uh, Brittany? Uh, yes, thank you. Okay. You're okay. welcome. So are there any questions or comment? Okay, so if we know, uh, uh, I'd like to talk about the uh, tomorrow's program. So the uh, uh, UNDIP group one will move to the tomorrow. Vivian Sensei. Yes, uh, for a while, uh, maybe today or we finish setting. <laughs> so yeah, only so the, we uh, uh, have uh, tomorrow. tomorrow. Uh, okay, so uh, I, I I think uh, we like, uh, I'd like to start the tomorrow's meeting uh, 25 minutes earlier. So the, uh, the, uh, the part of the tom tomorrow's uh, uh, speaker uh, is uh, Undip Group 1. Excuse me. Uh, so the, uh, I'd like to start the tomorrow's meeting from 1-5. Uh, so everyone is okay. Tomorrow's meeting uh, will start 
one five of the Japanese uh, time. Okay, meaning so that 20, yeah. 25 minutes earlier. Okay. 25 minutes, meaning that tomorrow we'll start by oh, Undeep. Maybe, uh, group, yeah. Maybe you can ask yeah. Abe Susanto. Okay. So for uh, UITM, maybe uh, they will start at 12 o'clock. Uh, yeah, 12 o'clock. Yeah. So please welcome 12 o'clock tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, anyway, uh, thank you very much for the uh, uh, great presentations. Uh, we are very enjoyed your uh, presentations. So uh, I'm looking forward to see you tomorrow. Okay. Okay. Excuse so me. then, uh, do you have any announcement, Bibin Sensei? Excuse me, Sensei. Uh, do you have any announcement? Uh, yes, I have some announcements. <laughs> Please. Uh, if you don't mind, before we close this uh, seminar, would you like to open your camera? I will. Uh, I would like to make uh, pictures together. Okay, please open Can your you camera. Can you open uh, camera? Uh, please show your face. Can you open camera? <laughs> yeah. Uh, we still. Yeah, I'm still waiting for. Okay. Uh, okay, so please, please wait for, smile. Uh, 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 wait, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> uh, so uh, I have an announcement to the KG student. So, okay. uh, so I, I'll say it by Japanese. So, okay, uh, to, uh, to, uh, okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, one, two, three. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. See you tomorrow. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Terima kasih, Prof. Ais. Prof. Ais, thank Terima you, Prof. Ais. Thank you. Thank you, Sensei. Thank you. thank you. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Raja. Thank you also. Kang Bibin, thank you. <laughs> See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Bye, Professor Fujiwara. Thank you.